Bodog poll question. What points threshold does Elias Pettersson surpass this year? 80, 90, 100, none of the above. Vote at secure some price on Twitter. Poker tips, sports odds, and free casino game. It's games. It's time to play at Bodog. And Bodog line of the day for me, they have posted the odds for each NHL team to make the playoffs. You can bet that right now at Bodog. And the Canucks are minus 130 on your Bodog line of the day. Here he is, our Canucks reporter, one half of the rink-wide duo with Andrew Wadden. He'll be in Penticton with us covering the Young Stars Tournament, welcoming Jeff Patterson back to the program. How are we doing? I'm good. I'm excited. Uh, Penticton is here. Young Stars is just around the corner. So Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to the weekend ahead. I say Penticton's here. I've got to get there first, obviously. Still (laughs) in the home studio. But, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, when we do this tomorrow, we'll all be there. And uh, I think it's going to kick off. It's a great way. It's just it's a really good way to kick off the hockey season. Um, I know you're the type of person who will track these things. Of course, what's going on at Eight Rings Scotia Barn is very much informal. Are Canucks prospects, do they have ice tomorrow? Will tomorrow be the first time a player in a Canucks jersey in an official capacity touches the ice? Or is that Friday? I think it's Friday. I think tomorrow is a okay. travel day. I think they're gathering and getting all the guys in that uh, have to make their way to town and uh, you know, they filled out that Young Stars roster with some major junior players from the Ontario League and the Quebec League as well. So I think uh, today and even some of tomorrow is uh, logistics of getting them here, doing a head count, and then uh, getting up to Penn Picton, <laughs> uh, and away they go. There are those two games. They play the late game on Friday, but there's an earlier game to start the tournament. So I'm not sure about morning skates and those types of things. Although, uh, as people know, or some people would know, uh, that South Okanagan Event Center is an incredible facility with two sheets of ice. And so... Um, you know, it's mm-hmm. just a great junior hockey facility, home of the Penticton V's. V's are playing an exhibition game on Saturday afternoon there, so they're sort of a part of this Young Stars weekend as well. And uh, it, yeah, you know, again, it's just like it's a mini hockey convention, uh, lots of different levels, lots of different people, media, scouts, management groups, uh, the players themselves, and then of course, uh, I think you're going to see a pretty good turnout of fans that uh, haven't had the opportunity to take part in this in the last couple of years. I saw the group sales. Uh, really are are through the roof. It's down to single seats now for a oh, lot good. of these games. So yeah. I, that's you know good well, on them, good on the organizers. The Canucks games tend to sell out there, and the community really supports the event. I mean, you draw from Oliver, Kelowna, and, and surrounding communities, but uh, we have been accustomed to a lot of Edmonton Oilers fans yep. in the past, either coming well, that's down my from curiosity. Alberta or Are Northern they going to be back? Be- are they going to be back? Do you think, guys? I mean, like it, it, it's, it's we we talked about it, it's a it's a strong group, but it's it's not Connor McDavid arriving. Right, I, I wonder right. if they make the drive this time around. Well, there's certainly the on ice quality, I suppose, but uh, God rest her soul, the Queen's giving everybody Monday the day off now. So, uh, well, not everybody, but uh, you do wonder if that's going to mm-hmm. you know if people can tack on an extra day. There's not a race necessarily to to get out of there on Sunday, and of course the Canucks do play. Uh, that final game on on Monday afternoon. So uh, who knows? But uh, right now it all looks like it's setting up to be a successful weekend and uh, just looking forward to being a part of it. Just so everyone is aware, we will have a show on Monday. Uh, it will not be special programming. <laughs> so not, ev- not everyone. Us. So you're yes. working, Patterson. Uh, we're all working uh, on Monday. Um, since we're on Young Stars, let's just start here. We're going to hit on Elias Patterson in a moment, Tyler Mott as well. But uh, I did it for my Tell Me I'm Wrong today that are we going with Linus or Linus? I guess we're going to have to ask him here. Huh? But Linus or Linus Carlson and Jeff, you made a big uh, um, you made a big point yesterday about the number of twenty two year olds and, and older that the Canucks are bringing to this Young Stars tournament. This is a twenty two year old, be twenty three this fall, who has four or five years of professional experience already in the Alsvenskan, including a banner year last year. As Blake reminds me, it is very difficult for an individual performer um, to dominate these sorts of proceedings for a variety of reasons. But I sure hope Carlson looks good here because there's a chance that he's the first centerman called up from for the Vancouver Canucks this year. There's a chance that this guy could be a very serviceable bottom six NHL player still. And I want to see some of that here in Penticton. Yeah, and I, I, I'm with you. I saw him, you know, the days that I was out at UBC in July – uh, hard to really, I mean, if I, I don't want to read into much in summer skates at uh, eight rinks, so I really don't want to read into too much uh, in the way of, you know, a summer development camp out at UBC in July. But 
you know, there is some expectation. As you said, 26 goals. I don't care what league or level, but he scored 26 in the SHL last year. So uh, you hope some of that translates. There's going to be an adjustment for him, obviously, to the smaller North American rink and just the size and the speed of the game. And certainly uh, next week at training camp and through an NHL preseason, he seems destined to start the year down in Abbotsford. But you're right. Like when you get to 22, turning 23, there isn't a whole lot of runway left in terms of your development. You're getting to that point where, you know, I think it's pretty clear what you are. But I think the Canucks believe that there is a player here. Uh, And so we shall see. I I think one of the things that they're going to experiment, you talk about him being a center. I think that's where he wants to play. But uh, they may do a little bit of easing in when you think of some of the veterans that they've got down in Abbotsford at the American Hockey League level, guys with AHL and you know, pro experience already that may be a little bit ahead of him on the depth chart, they may ease him in. I think they want to experiment at times with this player. So I'm with you. I mean, the Canucks are going with this older roster. I give Daniel Wagner from Pasta to Bullet credit. I I did some quick calculations yesterday and came up with six guys that are 22. He had the ages of every Canuck player on this Young Stars roster. They've got a 24 and a 23-year-old ahead of the 6 22 year old So, uh, I, again, I'm having trouble with the young part. I'm having trouble with the star part. But this is the Canuck roster that's uh, going to take the ice in Penticton this weekend. It's, uh, it's a, a roster that has the potential for, um, hey, a, a name to be made perhaps as well because we've outlined the, the handful of guys that um, – that we have a reasonable level of expectation. Do you think somebody can can set the hook and kind of declare themselves a little bit again? No one's going to run wild with it and proclaim them the you know the next superstar of the Vancouver Canucks. But is there something to be gained for somebody near the back of the roster that we we don't acclaim give that much acclaim to? I think so. And look, this isn't going to be a sexy answer to your question, but. I look at what the Canucks management group and Ryan Johnson, who obviously was hands-on in Abbotsford last year and Utica before that, you know, he challenged guys like Tristan Nielsen and Chase Waters, who had a full season in the American Hockey League last year, but were part of the development camp in July. And he challenged those guys. Like, I want you to be leaders. I want you to be leaders in the locker room. I want you to set the tone and the tempo for what's to come here on the gross grind. I expect you guys to be leaders for some of these young guys that are just getting their feet wet in professional hockey and in the scrimmage on the final day of that development camp at UBC, I thought both those guys were noticeable. And I know there are some in the organization that think that a player like Chase Waters, who was a standout in Saskatoon in the Western Hockey League, uh, you know, they really like his leadership qualities. There are some that think he could carve out some NHL games in that sort of depth role. I'm not saying he'd be the first guy to get the call from the farm. You know, and we focus on the Will Lockwoods of the world, and, and I think they're, you know, Lockwood's ahead of a player like Chase Waters. But I just think that low maintenance, guy that shows up, competes hard, and I would expect as a 22-year-old with some pro experience, you know, he only knows sort of one way to compete. And I would that's a name that I'm sort of expecting to notice just every shift that he's out there, doesn't take shifts off, doesn't cut corners and those types of things. And so I would expect that the Canucks are expecting – I would expect the Canucks are expecting uh, those guys to be leaders here in Penticton this weekend as well. Hey, we've talked about the cap problems in the NHL, guys. I mean, the elimination of a middle class means there's going to be a lot of battles at the bottom of rosters going forward. Guys like Chase Waters, who are borderline National Hockey League players, I mean, they've got to declare themselves, no, I'm going to be one of your $1 million guys going forward because those are, those are going to be needed, right? There's spots that will be coming available in the very near future, if not next year, for the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, absolutely. And, again, I don't really care how they get in the system. We spend so much time focusing on the draft and drafting and developing. But if it means that uh, you know you don't use a draft pick, but you use some capital to sign a guy as a free agent, Again, get them into the system, get them into the pipeline. And from here, now I think we're going to start to see the fruits of the labor of this increased investment in the player development system for the Vancouver Canucks, the personnel at the top, the, you know, the, the Mike Commissarek working the East Coast, Michael Samuelson over on the, you know, over in Europe, all those types of things. I mean, these are investments, again, to find players that they can get into the system and then from there, hopefully, uh, provide these guys an opportunity that they can prove their worth and one day uh, step up. So, yeah, I mean, the organization knows it's got to do a better job than it has really this past decade of promoting from within, and especially at the price point that you mentioned, Blake. And so, to me, whether they're drafted, whether they're free agents, 
you know, starting this weekend in Penticton, they're all sort of in the starting blocks together, and now they're trying to make a name for themselves in professional hockey. Yeah, and I, I think the level of player we're talking about here, whether it's Waters or Carlson, I mean, to me, they're sort of the second fleet of, of reinforcements. I think you got a battle to be on that fourth line, which is going to involve Joshua and uh, Hoaglander and Dickinson and maybe Lockwood and Dowling. And then I think, you know, your next tier is uh, the guys that we've been discussing and some of the guys who are going to be there at Young Stars. Okay, let's move on to Elias. Um, actually, let's do Tyler Mott and then we'll move on to Elias. Sure. Uh, one year, one point three five million from the Ottawa Senators, which uh, have had a they've had a very nice uh, off season, and they're going to need some support area um, supporting cast type of players. Um, delighted for Tyler that he got the deal first and foremost. It's been a very tough summer on the free agent market for that profile of player in this flat cap environment. And you know, we were just wondering, should the Canucks have bid at that price, Jeff? Uh, I think you saw his value on the market when they traded him a fourth round pick. He the, the legend of Tyler Bott in this market, I think, is a little greater than the player. And I say that with all the respect in the world to Tyler Mott. Uh, you know, he had uh, he was on an eleven goal pace in the forty nine games he played last year. Now, part of Tyler Mott's story is he hasn't stayed healthy through most of the seasons. And last year was coming off a serious neck injury that there were some questions, but. Also, he wasn't there at the start of the year, and where did the penalty killing go? Completely south, and that was a part of the story as well. Uh, I just think Tyler Mott's such an easy guy to like, and I say that as a media member, not as a, you know, I can understand where the fans are coming from. The hustle, uh, some of the production from a fourth-line capacity, uh, kills penalties, you know, is fearless, puts himself in harm's way with shot blocks and all those types of things, and then an open book with his ongoing battle with depression. And like, How can you not like Tyler Mott? But... You know, this is the reality of life now in the NHL is you got to be careful. You can't, you know, get glued to guys that are replaceable. And the Canucks think that they have found replacements there. But I think this is a great home for him. I think it's a good fit. Ottawa's already a quick team. They've got some guys that can move, and he'll fit in there seamlessly. Uh, He'll add to their penalty killing, uh, no doubt about it. And it's a one-year deal. And if the fit is good and he grows and the Senators take the step that they're hoping, you know, maybe it becomes a longer-term fit for him. But I think if Tyler Mott can stay healthy and do his things, that he'll be back in this boat next year. And hopefully for him, he doesn't have to wait until the 14th of September. Because I have to imagine a week out from NHL training camps, it was starting to get a little dicey in the Mott household about, you know, what's happening here and and ultimately where am I going to hang my hat for this coming hockey season. Yeah, a, gr- a great guy on and off the ice. And I- I'm actually I'm happy for his landing spot. Ottawa's a pretty fun place to be. He could be uh, a part of of something big. And I could, I could imagine, because it's a hockey market and it's a Canadian market, they're going to dig under the surface and find out more about Tyler Mott. And he, he might be landing in the perfect spot for himself, right? Yeah, again, this guy's low maintenance. Like, I, I think he'd yeah. be a pretty good fit wherever he goes. I think the Rangers were pretty happy with him, but uh, he was looking for a little bit more. And and that's you know, again, it's unfortunate that this was the timing for him that he hit the open market. But uh, as he found out, and he's not alone, a lot of those guys uh, a little closer to uh, the lower level of the pay scale. I had to bide their time, and we're just seeing the elimination of that middle class, and this is an example of that. Uh, Again, I I hope he stays healthy. I hope he has a productive season, and if that's the case, I'd have to think. He's only 27, so he's got some good years left ahead of him in the National Hockey League. I think if he has a good year, uh, the cap is going to go up here in the next couple of seasons. Maybe there is some security for him uh, in his next contract. All right, on to Elias. Did the welcome out on him today. Um, Just thought was very impressed with yesterday's media session on so many levels, but what stuck out to your ear, Jeff, as you listened to Elias meet the media here for the first time this season? Uh, I like the fact that uh, he was pretty self-critical of his performance on day one in the scrimmage, but uh, also gave himself the out of jet lag that he had arrived in town at seven o'clock the night before and woken up at four in the morning and then was on the ice out at eight ranks and uh, somehow wasn't uh, in mid-season form. Shocker. Uh, I mean, he kind of laughed at that. I, I laughed, too, at uh, the one thing there where he was struggling to find the right words and said, I haven't spoken English in a while, uh, I guess, uh, back home with family and friends. Uh, you know, Swedish is uh, the mother tongue, so uh, he'll have to get back. To, but he just looked comfortable. And you think back to the first year when, you know, the questions and the death stare, and there was so much learning and growth for him 
and he was so young. This is his fifth year. Like, how does that happen? Time just flies by. Like, I, I remember him scoring 10 goals in his first 10 games in the NHL, and here he is starting season number five. I, you know, Matt, the, the one thing that really jumped out at me was he didn't make any excuses for last year, but he copped to the fact that he was focusing on the wrong things. And he didn't really elaborate. Yep. I don't know if that meant the contract. I don't know if that meant uh, some of the off-ice pursuits. Whatever the case, he admitted that uh, this time last year, the headspace just wasn't quite right. And again, it's a first interview. I wasn't even there yesterday, but I did watch the interview that was posted by the Canucks. And it, it, it just, to me, there was a comfort level and a guy that seemed focused already and wanting. Under, I think also, like, he understands what he means to this organization, yep. too. Like, I, I think that there's a clear understanding that he is a star. There are other stars on this team, but I think he recognizes that for this team to take that step forward, they're going to be leaning on him and a big season from him. Well, I, and- I was thinking when I heard that quote, and I have no way of proving that I'm right, but I think that he was hearing some of the criticism, the critique, of his game was also hearing about people's uh, plaudits about his game and and saying that he's a Pavel Datsuk and thinking, okay, I've got to be the complete player now. And I think he was just thinking outside of himself rather than being the instinctual player that he is, which is already a pretty good 200 foot player. But I think he was, I, I think that's the way I took it is that he was thinking outside of himself rather than just being himself, being the player. And, 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 and you know, every player's trying to get better. Every, every player's trying to add things. But it sounded like he was just hyper-focused on it, maybe. Yeah, and I think I, I sensed a little relief in his voice. And I didn't really get a chance to attack this angle at the end of the season. But, you know, I think there was some real relief that that second half occurred kind of like, I still got it. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, for, sure. for really a, a year and a half with the injury and the point totals and the questions and the contract and everything else, mm-hmm. I think it was important that he had that second half. Yeah, they fell short. They didn't make the playoffs. He didn't get a chance to step up onto the postseason stage. But I, I, I kind of read through the lie, read between the lines yesterday that I still got it. And, and that second half of the season proved that to him. And so he's ready to hit the ground running this time around. Uh, I love the part about expectations being high, and then he followed with, and they should be. So, uh, you know, speaking uh, to to your point, Jeff, about what he means to this organization, how important a player he is to this club going forward. Blake and I both uh, um, noticed a, almost a little bit of sedinery there in, in in the comments yesterday that you know he had grown up a little bit, and you know was just seemed more like a veteran presence type of guy yesterday, whereas in other um, years he has seemed more like the young kid or as you say some of the immature stuff the deaf stare and the aloofness so we shall see uh what this season runs i think it's high time they give him a letter jeff you know i, I think this is the year I, I understand why oel and myers wore a's last year but i think you can probably move on and start turning over more of the leadership in a formal official capacity uh to the young group and, and heavy is with- the head that wears the crown there in some regards matt but jeff i i I think you want a little weight there, right? You do want a little bit of weight. You don't want an unbearable weight, but you do want him to feel the weight of that letter and be like, okay, th- this is this is what you are now. Yeah, and Brandon Sutter is not in the mix. He had uh, a letter. He was part of the leadership group. Again, like, the players know who the leaders are, and this isn't year one or two. I, I, I think this came up last week, and I had maybe it was just on Twitter, and I had some pushback. And again, he doesn't need this kind of pressure. I don't think we're in an A at this stage. No, no. A pressure point for him. He's not the captain. Uh, you're not expecting him to be more than he is. You're just recognizing what he means, his value to this team. It just sort of reinforces that. The Habs just made Nick Suzuki the captain. The Blackhawks made Jonathan Taves the captain at, uh, what, 19 years of age. Like, these guys are so prepared now, more than ever before. And again, this isn't year one or two. This is year five for Elias Pedersen. So I'd be down with that. I, I think you do want to start to turn this leadership over to some of the younger guys, that core that Patrick Alvin referenced. And I, I think it's a big year for Elias Pettersson. I think that there should be expectations on him. I know your poll question. I certainly got him pegged. Like, this is the year that he's got to be a point-a-game guy. Mm-hmm. And you'd love him to play all 82. Certainly, I would say he's got to play 70 and be a point-a-game guy, but I'd like it to be 75 or 80. Uh, you know, there's you're not guaranteed to play every game, obviously. Uh, but he's got to stay healthy. He, the Canucks need him to be healthy, and I just think this is the time. He's been close, but he hasn't been able. Kind of, we talk about Brock Besser in that 30 goal mark. I do think it's time. 
If the Canucks are going to take a step forward, they need a point a game season from Elias Pettersson. So I'm not saying 100 or 90 even. I would just say something in the 80s would be a highly successful season for this player, and it would represent a significant enough point jump that it would look like he had taken his game to the next level. Marvelous stuff, Jeff. Thank you for this, my friend. Look forward to Penn Ticton. We'll uh, catch back up tomorrow. Drive safe. Mm -hmm. Happy highways, and we'll see you in the Okanagan.